Now, judging by the discussion forum, this diagram has been causing a lot of trouble. So in this video, I'm going to take you through an explanation of this diagram very slowly and carefully. Now, to start off, we need to understand motions of galaxies. Let's imagine we start off with galaxies spread uniformly across space. Now, there are two different ways they could behave. The first way is if the galaxies don't weigh very much and space is expanding fast. What would they do in this situation? Well, they will simply be carried apart by the expansion of space, like this, just moving further and further away. In this case, the motion is very simple. It's just given by the Hubble law. Everything will have a redshift, and the redshift will be strictly proportional to distance. But now, let's imagine that, in fact, galaxies weigh quite a lot. They have a lot of mass, and space is not expanding. In this case, the motion will be very different. It will look like this. What you can see is they start off at rest, but slowly the gravity of one galaxy pulls on another until they all start moving together and they end up colliding or forming swarms called galaxy clusters. So these are the two extremes. Where does our own universe live? Well, clearly it's somewhere in between these two. Your space is expanding, but galaxies do have mass. So what you actually find is a superposition of these two effects. You find things moving apart, and you find, on top of that, the motions due to the gravity attracting one thing to another. On most scales, the expansion of space wins, but you can't ignore the attraction of one thing to another. Now, this effect of galaxies being pulled together by the mutual gravity are what we call the peculiar motions. So the true motion of a galaxy we see is a combination, a sum, of the Hubble flow, just the pure expansion of space, and the peculiar motions due to the pull of one galaxy on another. So what has all that got to do with this diagram? Well, let me explain where this diagram comes from. It comes from a big redshift survey, in this case the 2DF Galaxy Redshift Survey, and that always starts with a map of the sky. Here is a map of a large part of the southern hemisphere showing the location of all the galaxies. We now pick a narrow strip across here and then with a spectrograph we go and measure a spectrum of every galaxy in this narrow strip and hence measure the redshift of them all. Big job. We can now produce a slice of pizza diagram. What we're plotting here is along this side we're plotting where on the strip the actual galaxy is. So this would be the left-hand edge of the strip and this would be the right-hand edge of the strip. So this is angle on the sky. And on this axis we're plotting the redshift we measure from each spectrum. Remember we had to take a spectrum of every single one of these galaxies and every dot like this dot or that dot or that dot is one of the galaxies. So what we've got here is actually quite a nice slice through the three-dimensional structure. We can see galaxy clusters like this one or this one, and you can see filaments extending between the clusters and empty regions, voids like that one over there where there aren't very many galaxies. The next step, which is a tricky one, is to try and work out the average shape of the galaxy cluster. Now what we could do is just pick a whole bunch of clusters like this cluster and that cluster and then average all the shapes, but there's a better way. What we do is we take every galaxy in turn. So let's say, for example, we take this galaxy here, and we draw an imaginary box about it. And each box, we look at where all the other nearby galaxies are. So in this case here, that's our galaxy, and there's a couple there, and one there, and a few over here, and so on. And we do that in turn for every single galaxy, including the ones in clusters and the ones that are not. And so we get diagram after diagram showing where the other galaxies nearby each galaxy actually are. And each of these diagrams, the vertical axis is telling you the difference in redshift, and the horizontal axis is showing you the difference in angle along the slit. And then what we do is, by the time we've got one of these diagrams for every single galaxy in the entire survey, and this plot is actually only a tiny fraction of the survey. The survey actually includes many other slices. We then add them all up. So we add this to this to this. And that gives us a map showing the relative location of any galaxies near one. So it's for every galaxy where, on average, every other galaxy near it is going to be. And that's what this plot is. It is just a plot showing if you have a galaxy in the survey, where other galaxies nearby are most likely to be. 
So the centre here marks an average galaxy in the survey, and we've worked out for every galaxy where other ones nearby are going to be. This dimension here shows the shift in angle, and this dimension shows the shift in redshift. And what you can see, bottom line, is it's very high in the middle, which is telling us that the most likely place to find a neighbouring galaxy is close to the first one. And as you go further away, that goes less and less, which means you're less and less likely to find another galaxy at these bigger distances. And this is simply because galaxies are clustered. They like living near other galaxies. And eventually it levels out at some level in the outskirts, which is just the average density of galaxies. So this diagram is showing you that galaxies are clustered. They tend to be near other galaxies. But that's not all it's showing you. If we really did know the proper three-dimensional position of the galaxies, then this diagram should look like a perfect circle. Why? That would be telling us that on, on average, galaxy clusters are symmetrical. They don't have a favourite direction. So, for example, if you see a galaxy here, you're going to find more galaxies equally likely in any direction. You could get galaxies in this direction, or that direction, or this direction, or that direction, and all of these things are equally likely. That's saying that the universe doesn't have a preferred direction. If you saw something like this, it would mean that if you find a galaxy, your odds are going to find another one in this direction or that direction, which would be a bit weird. That would be telling you that every galaxy cluster in the universe was elongated in the same direction. That would be telling us that the universe had some preferred direction. But instead, it seems that galaxy clusters are random. Some are pointed one way, some are pointed the other way, some are circular, some are funny blobby shapes. But on average, it should all add, add up to a circular shape. And that's what we would see if this really was a measure of distance along here and distance along there. But if you remember, this axis here in the cone is not distance, it's redshift. And redshift is telling you the velocity. What we've been assuming so far is that the velocity at which a galaxy is moving away from us is telling you how fast it is moving away from us, and hence just the distance. So we're assuming that galaxies don't weigh anything, and that everything is just obeying the Hubble flow, being carried apart by the expansion of space. Now, if that was the case, then this would purely be a measure of distance, and we would expect to see purely circular patterns. But if you remember, the actual motion of a galaxy is partially due to the expansion of space, but also partially due to its peculiar motions. It's falling into and orbiting around other galaxies. So you've actually got two different effects going on here. You've got how far away the galaxy is, which determines its redshift via the Hubble flow, but added to that, we've got its peculiar motions. And that is why this diagram has the funny shape it does. So let's try and figure out how the peculiar motions of galaxies are going to affect it. Let's say we have a cluster of galaxies, a really dense cluster, so it's all very small. Now in these clusters, the galaxies are all whizzing around each other under the mutual gravity, so they're going in orbits around each other, flying in and out, much like a swarm of bees. And this is because of their mutual gravitational pull. Now how is that going to look to a galaxy survey? So what you'd do is you'd see on the sky in your image a whole bunch of galaxies close together, and you'd measure a redshift for each of them. And then you'd plot a diagram showing position on the sky against redshift. Now you'd think that because it's a cluster, and therefore very small, they're all very close together, they're all at about the same distance. Let's assume the Earth's down here, we're looking from down there. They're all about the same distance from us. So what you'd think you'd see would be a whole bunch of things at about the same angle, the same distance, so you'd see a dense cloud of points over here. But in fact, even though these galaxies are all at the same distance, because some of them are moving fast along the line of sight, we're going to get the wrong redshift. So for example, this galaxy is moving towards us quite fast, whereas that one is moving away from us quite fast. What this means is that when you measure the redshift of this galaxy, you'll get the redshift due to its distance, but on top of that, you'll get its Doppler motion towards us. And that Doppler effect will blue shift its lines relative to what you'd expect if it was just sitting here stationary. Likewise, this one over here, you're going to get its normal redshift from its distance, plus an extra redshift because it's moving away from us. So what you'll see is that instead of getting a cloud of points like this, 
you'll find that some of them you're actually going to mistakenly think are closer in than you imagine because they're moving towards us and that is partially compensating for the true redshift. Some you'll think are further away. So what you actually find is a cloud of points like this. And this is what's called a finger of God in the surveys because it seems to be a finger of galaxies pointing straight at us because we're down here at redshift zero. But now let us consider the galaxies that are on the outskirts of clusters, like over here or over there or over there. These might be in some of those filaments falling into the cluster or something like that. Now what are they going to look like to our survey? Consider this galaxy here. It's at a shorter distance than the cluster, so you'd think it would have a lower redshift and it would show somewhere like that in the diagram. Whereas this galaxy over here is a bit to the right and at a further away, so it'd have a higher redshift, so it'll show up over there. So you'd think that you get a spherical cloud of points all the way around here. But once again, that's ignoring the fact that these galaxies are affected by the gravity of the cluster. These ones are far enough away from the cluster that they're not strongly affected, but they are a little bit affected. And what's going to happen is they're by and large going to be pulled in towards the cluster compared to what their true motions would be if, if they're nothing at any mass and the universe is just expanding. Most of them are probably never going to fall into the cluster. While they are being pulled in by the gravity, in practice the amount of space between the cluster and them is expanding so fast they'll never actually reach there. But what it means is when you look at something like this, you'd expect to see it at this redshift, but because it's moving away from us, in addition to the redshift due to its distance, you have to add a little bit more redshift because of its motion. So what this means is instead of seeing it here, you'll see it up around there, a little bit closer to the cluster. Likewise, ones at the far side, they should have a higher redshift than the cluster, but because they're falling in, you've got to take off their motion. So instead of being up here, it might be down a bit over there. Likewise, one over here, you can't measure the sideways motion, but it'll have a component of its motion towards the cluster, which will slightly add to its redshift. So the net effect is that instead of seeing a circular cloud of points, you see a slightly elongated cloud of points. The ones on the near side are moving towards the cluster, therefore they're moving away from us a little bit, and that means we mistakenly think they're further away than they really are. The ones on the far side are falling into the cluster, so in addition to their redshift due to the expansion of space, they also have a little bit of blue shift due to their motion towards us. So we mistakenly think that they're closer in than they really are. So that gives us the flattening in the shape. So when we combine these two effects, if we plot relative angle here and relative redshift over there, what we should see is for the objects right in the middle of clusters, we'll see them elongated like this because they're all swarming around each other, which means they have very large motions towards or away from us, which means we mistakenly think they're closer or further away. Then for the ones that are further out, those are still falling in towards the cluster. They probably never reach it. But that means the ones on the near side, we think they're further away than they really are, and the ones on the far side, we think they're closer. So you get a flattened shape like this. And these fingers of God and the flattening are a way of measuring the density of galaxies and clusters and superclusters in the universe on bigger scales than any other method. So they're very useful.